welcome to English Club TV. I'm Ashley Jenkins. And I'm Casey Cronin. And we are here today with Professor Sills. Can you describe to us your path to becoming a professor? I was actually originally studying to be an attorney. The school where I went to undergrad was very big on turning out attorneys. And I went through the whole rigmarole. I took the LSAT. I did everything. And then I finally got to the point where I clerked at a law firm. It was an intellectual property firm, which is not your like sexy go to court kind of law. Um, <laughs> and I just decided at the very last minute my senior year that no, no, that, that wasn't what I wanted to do. And I looked around to see where good was being done in the world and I saw my professors. And I thought, well, if they're doing good, then I can do that as well. And so I, I took a gap year. I did AmeriCorps in between uh, where I actually worked at a university and led a, a sexual assault prevention kind of campaign. And then I went to graduate school and I never looked back. Wow. So how many years of schooling did you have to do to get all done? Uh, if you count undergrad, 10. But I don't like to because that's a lot. So we're going to call <laughs> it six. Two for master's, four for PhD. OK, awesome. So um, the next question. I'm a communication studies major and an English minor. And so since this is English Club TV and we're interviewing the communication studies professor, in your opinion, how can these two fields play off of each other? Beautifully, wonderfully, like a symphony. Mm -hmm. Really, because in communication, what we're studying is expression of ideas. And in English, what we're studying is expression of ideas. Now, there's a little divergence there. Communication tends to be a little more practical about, you know, if I were making a speech about this thing, how would I craft it to persuade people? Or how would I make a decision in a small group? Whereas English puts more emphasis on the aesthetic, um, making beauty out of things, making the fantastical out of things. And frankly, I don't think you can have one without the other, really. Because if we are just going to be very practical all the time, it's boring. Uh, whereas if we're going to be fantastical all the time, then we lose the real world purchase of what we're looking at. So combining mm -hmm. the two is going to be, I think, very fortuitous for you in the future because you can do both and whenever you want. All right. And what is your advice for students who want to explore the field of communication studies? If you're coming into comm studies, you need to be ready to think very deeply. And I really want to stress that because at a lot of schools, communication studies is the easy major. And that's totally not the case at Northern. But it's worth it because it makes you really consider stuff you do every day, like talk or gesture or exist, basically, um, in, in, a, in a way that makes you craft it before you do it. Because I'm sure we can all think of times that we said the first thing that popped into our head, and it was a bad idea, and we should not have done it, and we had disastrous results. And if you start majoring in communication studies and thinking about the things you say, you're more effective, and you do it better. So that's what I mean when I say think deeply, and be prepared to really consider everything you do. Because if you take communication definitionally to its greatest extreme, everything is communication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's really thinking about everything. You're the communication studies um, club advisor on campus, which is a new club, mm -hmm. which is awesome. What does the communication studies club have in store for events in the future? Oh, so much. You should get really hype right around Valentine's Day. And I'm not going to be very revealing about what's going to happen, but Lambda Pi Eta, which is the name of the communication studies club, we love you. We're going to let you know uh, <laughs> around Valentine's. Then coming up in March, we are kind of playing off the name of the club, Lambda Pi Eta. And so we're having a pie eating contest. But to really make sure that we're true to the communication studies origin of the, the nature of the club, we are going to also be playing communication-based games during the pie eating contest. So things like uh, apples to apples, Pictionary, things where you really have to like, get an idea across. And that's going to be a really good time. And it's also, we are hoping, really going to draw attention to the club. And then once we hit April and things are winding down and we have to start taking everything very seriously toward finals week, um, we're actually going to have an induction for the National Honor Society, of which Lambda Pi Eta is a satellite chapter. So we're going to have a very formal gathering where people will go through the induction ceremony, You know, fancy food, fancy clothes. Parents can come if they're so inclined. Um, and we're just going to use that as a nice way to end the semester with a, a very pretty bookend. All right. That sounds fun. See, what um, book are you reading right now, or what TV show are you watching, or both? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> it's a big question, uh, because I think people should read and watch TV. 
Like, I, I'm not one of those professors who's like, I never watch TV, <laughs> because TV is amazing. And if you want to be able to talk to people, you have to have that common ground. But at the same time, everybody should read. Everybody should be reading as much as they can. I always try to read at least 60-ish uh, books a year, just Dang. because that's how you absorb things, and that's how you make yourself a better writer. Now, I'm not saying everybody should do that, but all of that is to say, I'm currently watching The Crown, which is a Netflix series about Queen Elizabeth II, which I think is really interesting because my entire life she's been this little old lady who's in charge of England somehow, but I didn't really pay attention to her, but her story is fascinating. So I, I highly recommend the series. Uh, Book-wise, I'm trying to work my way through the entire body of Lewis Carroll, who's the, the guy that wrote Alice in Wonderland, mm -hmm. and it's trippy. <laughs> it is trippy stuff. Um, in the moment, I'm in the middle of a, a book one of his lesser known works called Sylvie and Bruno, which is about two little children who have very somehow logical but also philosophical adventures in this, this you know, fantastical land. Um, so I would recommend it if you're looking for something to really take your, your brain out of the top of your head and shake it around a little. <laughs> would you say you prefer fiction over nonfiction? Uh, I went through a period when I was probably in master's school where I was too snooty to read fiction. I thought there was nothing I could get out of it and I needed to, you know, real world experience in, in my books. But increasingly I'm drawn toward fiction, not only because it's more relaxing to read, but also because I think it lets possibility come to light more than just trying to maintain veracity. Mm -hmm. So, you have told us that you like SNL. This is the best SNL skit in your opinion? The best SNL <laughs> skit. Or what do you like out of their categories? Uh, it's really hard to say. <laughs> like, I don't know if you're familiar with like the entire corpus of Saturday Night Live, but there's a skit where Steve Martin is acting like King Tut and he's <laughs> dancing and singing this ludicrous song and it's amazing because it's <laughs> ludicrous. Increasingly we're seeing SNL get more and more political, but if you look back to like the 90s, it was political but like funny political. It wasn't like hard-hitting critique. It was just like, I'm going to imitate George Bush and use mm -hmm. gestures that he used to the general entertainment of, of everyone around me, right? And I, I think that's kind of the show's high point. You mentioned how the political sketches have changed. Yes. What do you think makes for a good satirical climate? There's, there's a concept called a, a frame of play that has to be operational if you want satire to work. People have to take a situation seriously enough that they want the power dynamic explored because that's what satire is. It takes power and it knocks it down. But if people are not willing to play with an idea, then you can't do that. So, for example, after 9-11, there was this moratorium on funniness. Like, nobody was willing to get up and be funny on TV because it was scary. Because how are you going to make fun of that? There's no play around that giant quantity of death. So I think kind of what we're seeing now is an increasing distance from a play frame because everybody is taking politics incredibly seriously right now, as well they should. It's, it's an interesting time to be alive. But when you're seeing people like the, the SNL comedians trying to play into some species of satire, they can't even do it anymore. I don't know if you've seen the most recent sketches from I think this past weekend or two weekends ago they started doing a, an anti-Trump sketch and they stopped in the middle and broke the fourth wall and said this isn't funny anymore. Oh, wow. And I think that's where we've gotten to, where people's willingness to play is just totally out the window. I saw this one thing on the internet where it was, is this an Onion article title or is this a real news article? <laughs> yep. And it's gotten to that sad point. You can't tell anymore, can you? And as much as people are trying to like teach us to read fake news, fake news is attractive because we want it to be true. So we're going to keep reading it because it's neat. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that's going to get us, but it's certainly getting us to a point where we can't laugh. So if you were an SNL character, who would you be and why? <laughs> mm, who would I be? I really do want to be Steve Martin in the King Tut skit. Um, <laughs> But I, there's a character that Andy Kaufman did, and I think this was on Saturday Night Live, but I'm not positive, where he was just so awkward in public he couldn't function, and eventually he just made all these awkward noises repeatedly so much it turned into a song, and he just sang his awkward song with awkward noises and walked off stage. <laughs> and I, I'm not saying that's necessarily how I teach, but I think that's something we can all identify with, the idea that you're on stage, and it's scary, and you're going to mess stuff up, so you might as well roll with it. Who are the best satirical artists of our time? 
I adore Stephen Colbert, and I know he's past his satirical prime, but I think he's fascinating because they've done studies on him, and after especially the Colbert Report, they asked audiences, what do you think of Stephen Colbert? And basically, half of the audience didn't know he was being satirical. They agreed with what he was saying on his show so much, they thought he was an actual conservative pundit, and they loved it, and they loved him. And isn't that a master craftsman that can oh, do it man. so well that you can't tell the difference between him making fun of a group and being part of a group? Wow. And either way, he was funny. So I, I think that's very well done. It's like he, the sarcasm where it's so deadpan yep. that you can't tell if people are being sarcastic or not. Exactly. <laughs> you go into your car, you turn on the radio. What is the first song that starts playing? Uh, okay, here's the thing. I used to work in radio. I've had two different radio shows. I love working in radio. I never listen to the radio. I never listen to it. Although I recently broke my iPod because I left it out in the car during that 40 degree or oh, negative no. 40 degree cold snap. Oh. So I had to listen to the radio and I turned it on and they were talking about the Oprah speech where everybody was like, Oprah for president 2020. <laughs> and the guy on the radio was like, yeah, well, if Oprah's president, we'll have to go on a diet. And I was just like, who let you on the radio? <laughs> like, why would you say these things? And so I went right back to my iPod as soon as I got it repaired. Because Oprah thing. can control that, obviously. She'd be our dictator. Yes. And <laughs> in our homes. We'd all have to us. love bread. <laughs> <laughs> we'd all get that. things every show. Yes. Ex oh my goodness, that would be great. She, imagine Oprah, she is campaigning. <laughs> and then she goes, and you get a car, and you get a car. Yes. I will vote for her if she gives me a car. <laughs> That's democracy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you have a cat. Could you tell us his fun name? <laughs> I actually have two cats now. Very <gasps> Ooh, exciting news. Good. My first cat's name is the Dread Pirate Roberts, which is <laughs> so good. <laughs> thank you. Uh, a reference to the Princess Bride. But we have a new cat, um, mm. and it's a little tuxedo cat. It's about six months Cute. old. It is feisty, um, but it's got this dark face with these big white whiskers and it looks like a little old man so we named it cat stevens oh that's so cute uh, i love cats is chocolate pie real pie <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> i think i need more context for this question okay so in i think pie is defined as it needs to have fruit inside of it Chocolate pie is just putting chocolate pudding inside a pie crust. Yeah. That's a lazy pie. That's a pie crust. It's a pie. <laughs> you could put motor oil in a pie crust and it would be an oil <laughs> pie. That's how pie works. Chicken pot pie, that doesn't have fruit. Pizza pie doesn't have fruit, except tomatoes, which are technically yeah. a fruit. Okay. I guess you are making fair points. I still stand <laughs> behind my wrong opinion, but... I admire your conviction. <laughs> Ooh, one more question from me. So, um, you've been a de debate coach in your past. What is your favorite debate topic? My eternal favorite debate topic that I will always have people debate is whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich. I was going to ask that in rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you, you, can't, you can't really answer it either way. There's compelling arguments both ways, and the best one I've ever heard is that a, if a Subway sandwich is a sandwich, then a hot dog is a sandwich. But I still, I love, I love listening to people talk about it. It's crazy. Because a Subway sandwich is just a big bun. Yeah, yep. it's connected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never thought of that before. <laughs> oh, man. So that's it for today. Thank you for watching English Club TV, and we'll see you next time.